Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita. Hey everybody and welcome to Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm continuing my Western Core series with none other than Dante. I'm focusing uh, just on his Inferno instead of the whole Commedia, although Paradiso, or Paradiso and, um, and Purgatorio uh, make up that triad. Uh, and threes, uh, of course, as any religiously sourced text would have it, threes uh, feature quite prominently in this work of, uh, of extreme and meticulous uh, structuring and very, very high art. So first, um, let's go through some advertisements for Dante's Inferno uh, from Clifton Fadiman, The Lifetime Reading Plan. Dante's masterpiece is the most ordered long poem in existence. And Dante is a great painter and a great architect. From David Denby, The Great Books, <clears throat> he says, the great Christian epic is a flabbergasting work, crazily methodical, both sublime and grotesque, cruel, dismaying, a work that bursts the usual moral and literary categories. From Harold Bloom, the Western canon, Dante is the most aggressive and polemical of the major Western writers, dwarfing even Milton in this regard. Nothing else in Western literature is as sub sublimely outrageous as Dante's exaltation of Beatrice. His poem is a prophecy and takes on the function of a third testament, in no way subservient to the old and the new. And uh, that's quite a striking statement to conceive of um, the Commedia as being a sort of third testament where Dante, you know, not only subsumes his poetic predecessors like Homer and Ovid and Virgil, um, but also carves out his own place in the religious canon. Uh, from Genius, Harold Bloom, one cannot discuss genius in all the world's history without centering upon Dante, since only Shakespeare of all geniuses of language is richer. If you know anything about Harold Bloom, you know that he has been called a bardolater. He um, loves, loves, loves Shakespeare, and a lot of his books just about mention Shakespeare on every page. Uh, sort of maddening sometimes. But here he inserts Dante just after. Um, from Dante, A Life, which is a biography by R.W.B. Lewis, he says, Dante was a poet who commanded the languages and ideas of the major classical schools of philosophy and the theological ranges of the 13th century. No literary work ever written yields more to this manner of analysis, meaning the four levels of meaning, than does the Divine Comedy, with its hypnotic episodes and encounters and characters, its elaborate and always coherent moral scheme, its expansive views of what was happening to Florence, Italy, and Europe, and its Thomistically derived portrait of divinity, and that's talking about uh, St. Thomas. At the same time, Dante is the supreme example of literary history of a writer who, at every important turn, is seeking himself, humanly, morally, psychological, imaginatively, finding himself, defining himself, in effect, telling his life story. Some major uh, attributes of the work um, that stake Dante's place. Here, in the last video, uh, we looked at the Odyssey of Homer, which was somewhere around 800 BC. Now we've just skipped ahead something like uh, 1500 years, and we find ourselves uh, in, in the early and mid 14th century with Dante. Now, we think about how much has happened in that time. You know, the Golden Age of Greece has given way to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire has fallen. Latin has become the official language of learned people. Um, the, the Middle Ages um, has occurred. The rise of Catholic theology has occurred. The consecration of Aristotle. Um, and we think about all the literature now um, in, in contrast to Homer or Ovid or Virgil um, or the Greek tragedians. We now have a, a, a welter of literature um, that we 
that that a great poet like Dante would be consuming. And, and even now, we think about in our day, uh, every literary critic or, or literary-minded person or historian and so on, um, there's always this daunting uh, phase at the beginning of our career, and really all throughout, um, because there's this urge to need to know everything that came before, but it's getting more and more impossible. However, uh, Dante comes in um, and, like I said, stakes his claim. He devises his own rhyming scheme, the terza rima. Um, he ignored the standard Latin of his day for works of high art um, and deferred to his native Tuscan dialect. He inserted himself directly in the work as Dante the Pilgrim. Um, he subsumes his immediate um, and, and most gigantic literary predecessor, Virgil, and makes him his guide, um, at least um, until he gives way to Beatrice. He rigorously constructs this work uh, where it's not just random torment through these circles of hell, but the torments rather are designed to uh, fit the, the sins. So for example, um, in the circle that deals with heretics and people who have caused schisms or splits um, in, in, in the church, um, they're being torn in half, just as a schism would be a split. Uh, when we talk about, of course, that opening line, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, what this means is, uh, you know, most people know this, midway through our life or midway through life. Um, that puts Dante the Pilgrim at about 35 years old because the agreed upon lifespan at that time was 70 years, so halfway would be 35. Um, this is also about the age that we believe Jesus died, maybe around 33, which again, threes, threes. The cantos um, of each work are based on a three. Uh, there are 33 of them, but then there's this prologue. Um, that gives it technically 34. On the subject of the opening line, I have three translations that I've read here. Um, first of all, there's this uh, Robert Pinsky translation. I love this because it's bilingual. Um, so we have the original Italian on this page, but he chooses to uh, translate this as midway on our life's journey, which is very close to Mark Musa's translation, which I read um, for this video. Um, he says, midway along the journey of our life. Alan Mandelbaum from my beautiful um, Every Man's Library hardcover, he says, when I had journeyed half our life's way. Again, the Musa translation, this really uh, th this was a re this is a real treat. This Penguin edition it is packed with sumptuous notes. Um, there's a huge introduction um, to the work itself into Dante's life. There's a translator's introduction where he talks about um, how he how he uh, came up with this translation. Uh, there are copious end notes to each canto. Um, and then there's a huge glossary in the back. There are also these little diagrams and charts. Um, and as we can see here, this is the conception of the world um, in Dante's day, where we see Jer Jerusalem at the top and Mount Purgatory at the bottom. And then if we look at hell, um, as we can see at the top, it's a lot wider. It's sort of a funnel. And there, right in the middle of the earth, at the center of gravity, is where uh, Lucifer resides. And uh, we'll talk about how Dante took this conception of the earth um, and ended this piece, the Inferno, um, brilliantly. Harkening back to Beatrice, which um, this is his muse, um, really, this is his spiritual leader. Um, which is an interesting twist on religious thought of the day. Uh, his, his book of uh, sort of a mix of prose and poetry, La Nuova Vita, or The New Life, 
uh, tells the story of his love, and and it's a very interesting and heartrending story. He saw Beatrice when they were both very young. I can't remember, maybe, maybe about 11, 9 or 11, something like that. He saw her walking by, and he instantly fell in love, but he could never really get up the nerve um, to really pursue um, his his amorous feelings for her, and, uh, and then she died uh, quite young. So, you, interestingly, you never hear about Dante's own wife in any of his work, but yet you you see Beatrice um, as this canonical and sacred figure in his life. Again, Dante um, takes command of all the literature that came before him, um, f from epic poetic literature like Homer, Virgil, Ovid, uh, the Catholic literature at the time, um, which is chiefly the theologies of Augustine and St. Thomas, um, and then finally Aristotle, who was the word on philosophy. In fact, Virgil will constantly chide uh, Dante the Pilgrim, uh, saying, you know, remember your physics, remember your rhetoric, and who he's referring to is, of course, Aristotle. So confident in his place in the literary canon, uh, Dante not only brings Virgil into the work, but virtually every major personage of all that has come before, and one of whom comes straight from the previous video on the Odyssey, um, Ulysses. Um, and he puts Ulysses into the work, and, and, and of course U Ulysses was a pagan um, for all of his stature and glorification in the classical age, but after all he was a pagan so he is in the Inferno. Um, and, and he, Dante, gives Ulysses a final voyage that has no literary precedent. It does not come from the Odyssey, and in fact, um, centuries later when Tennyson pins his great poem uh, Ulysses, he bases that not on Homer, but on Dante. Dante assaults our senses, and this even comes through in the English. Again, this is the Musa translation. Just a couple of selection. Here, sighs and cries and shrieks of lamentation echoed throughout the starless air of hell. Sounds on sounds of weeping pound at me, bellowing like the sea racked by tempests. A man who feels the shiver of a fever coming on, his nails already dead of color, will tremble at the mere sight of cool shade. Weird shrieks of lamentation pierce through me like arrow shafts whose tips are barbed with pity so that my hands were covering my ears. As I said earlier, looking at that chart uh, or diagram of conception of the world at that time, uh, probably the most impressive design in the whole architecture um, of this poem and the brilliance that's on display is, like I said, the very close when we finally get to Lucifer. Um, and Lucifer, unexpectedly, maybe for first-time readers who don't know, um, is in a frozen lake. And uh, with these huge wings, he's this enormous figure. Um, you know, we may expect him to be red and have a pitchfork and, and be in these flames unburned, but no. He's, in a, he's in a, frozen in a lake of ice, which is somehow more chilling, if you'll forgive the pun. Musa does a good job of breaking down the way in which uh, Dante thought of how to portray Lucifer. Um, this is, of course, the climax that all of the circles are leading up to. Um, Lucifer was cast headlong down to the earth. Uh, for his fall, and Dante imagines that the impact of Lucifer's fall burrowed him down into the earth, um, all the way to the center, which is the center of gravity. This forced the earth from the core up to the surface, which formed a cave in which Lucifer lives. Um, this also necessitates Virgil to turn his body as Virgil is leading Dante, I think on his back, um, down Lucifer's flanks. When he's right midway down Lucifer himself, he has to turn in such a way he can exit the cave and come out on it within the other hemisphere. This is why it is suddenly night and why when the pilgrim turns and looks back at the cave, 
He does not see Lucifer oriented the way that he expected. This is that's absolutely brilliant uh, on the part of Dante. I'd also uh, be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Eric Auerbach's mimesis, um, the the presentation of reality in Western literature. This is some of the most remarkable literary criticism. Um, Auerbach takes tiny scenes um, from great literature, in fact, starting with Odysseus's scar, um, and seizes on these things um, and, and digs into them with such a brilliant uh, literature-saturated mind uh, that no one uh, can fail to be impressed. And he includes in his uh, eighth chapter uh, a small scene from Dante's Inferno um, and shows how um, how brilliant it is. Um, so I highly recommend this. Thus concludes my remarks on Dante's Inferno. Uh, there's so much more to say about this, but as I'm trying to do in all these videos, I'm trying to seek out um, some remarks that uh, maybe aren't in most videos or, or most essays. Um, again, not that I have this brilliant mind, but um, I just don't want to bore you with rehashes of things that most people already know. So I hope you've enjoyed it, um, and our next video will be on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Thank you all for watching.